QC Pod is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. To learn more, visit us at queenspodcastlab.org slash qcpod. On this episode of the QC Pod, Sammy Ali is joined by Dr. Bobby Kabuto, Department Chair of the Elementary and Early Childhood Education Department at Queen's College. After a year of education taking a backseat to public safety, students are now facing insurmountable learning challenges. Together, the two discuss how the pandemic has affected education in the country and the lingering effects that are sure to follow. reveals the ins and outs of education and the many hurdles facing students in America today. After a year of education taking a backseat to safety, students are now dealing with perhaps the most detrimental pandemic-based challenge, the learning gap crisis. Young people across the country are continuing to fall behind academically, largely due to the distance learning barriers exacerbated by the pandemic. The students hit hardest by learning gaps include students of color, students from lower income families, and students with disabilities, according to a recent New York City Controller Report. With me now to discuss learning gaps and how teachers should address them is Dr. Bobby Cabuto, Professor and Department Chair of the Elementary and Early Childhood Education Department at Queens College. Dr. Cabuto, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me today, Sammy. So I feel like a lot of people have heard the term, but don't exactly know what learning gaps are. Can you tell me a little bit about them? Sure. Sometimes we use the term learning gaps. Um, Sometimes we use the term learning loss. Um, Those terms have taken on some renewed meaning since the pandemic. So I'm going to use the term learning loss. I think that's a little bit more descriptive of what folks are talking about um, in education since the onset of the pandemic. And generally what how we define learning loss is that students are not learning new content uh, new content at the same rate and consistency as they would in you know n- more normal circumstances so sometimes prior to the pandemic we might have talked about learning loss or learning gaps over summer months um, that is certainly not um, kind of parallel to what we're talking about now since the pandemic. When we talk about learning loss now, we're talking about more major gaps in learning um, in relation to learning content and mastering skills at the same rate that we would have if there had not been a pandemic. So when I like to kind of think of learning loss in the pan- during the pandemic as more of learning inequities because yes, the pandemic has caused a lot of disruption in schooling. We had to pivot very quickly in the spring um, of 2020 to online learning. Um, that pivot, we were not prepared um, technologically for that pivot. And um, it took some time for us to get up, up and running and, um, and moving. But as you talked about in your opening, the populations that were the hardest hit were uh, our populations where there's low socioeconomic um, communities, um, populations where there is a high underrepresentation of students, um, meaning students of color, um, linguistically diverse students, students of socio- low socioeconomic statuses, um, s- communities where there wasn't equal and consistent access to technology, those tended to be the populations that were the most impacted by the pivot to, um, to um, online learning in the spring of 2020. These, mm-hmm. that pivot really only exasperated the inequalities that were already existing in education. Um, if we think about, let's just talk, talk about, for example, um, a community that might be, have a high population of underrepresented um, students, particularly maybe let's say students of color, um, black and brown students, 
schools in those communities tended to always show lower progress in state testing when it came to math and English language arts. Mm -hmm. um, what, what COVID did was make that gap even bigger. So um, when we think about, like I like to think about not so learning, I mean, we can think about learning loss, but really for me, it's a little bit more accurate to think about the learning inequities that COVID has put forth. Because if we start to look at learning loss across socioeconomic statuses, across communities of color and white communities, you will probably see, and, and um, there's a, a, um, a report that came out of um, PACE that showed that communities of color tended to have bigger gaps than communities that were predominantly white. So um, when you think about that, it's, it's just exasperating what we already knew prior to COVID, but COVID has really brought um, those discussions to the surface. Mm -hmm. So you wrote about this in an article mm -hmm. for NCTE or National Council of Teachers of English, mm -hmm. where you outline some of the findings from this recently released National Assessment on Student Achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about what this assessment was and, and what it revealed? Sure. So um, in that blog um, for NCTE, um, the title of the blog was What Do Standardized Assessments Measure? Um, and it really was a reflection on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is called NAEP. It's also known as the Nation's Report Card. The Nation's Report Card is sponsored by the federal government. And what it does is that every few years, every so often, it does a national assessment of student progress, educational progress. Those who are proponents of the National Report Card in NAEP argue that rather than focus on particular standardized high stakes testings in states, they draw on data nationally. So it's a true random, random sampling of students in um, in K to 16 settings, you know, the different settings that they're assessing in. So um, what this report card did was reflected on the um, 2018 oral reading fluency study. What the 2018 oral fluency study did, which is the one that I read, reflected on its study from 20, uh, 2002. So it kind of revisited the data and looked at, you know, what is happening in terms of oral fluency across stu uh, in students across the nation. And um, there are, you know, there are a lot of findings in that report. But what I was really concerned about is what, what do these tests tell us and what do they not tell us? And if we look at the findings of the test, we can certainly see that it continues to repeat a larger narrative where students of color, linguistically diverse students, typically underrepresented populations, repeatedly perform lower than upper middle, middle to upper class white students. It, what it does, inherently is to perpetuate a narrative that focuses around deficit perspectives of underrepresented students. So in other words, because it's such a big sweep, then that narrative becomes, because students of color perform, underperform white students, we need to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes this kind of large sweep intervention program that does not get at the local and knowledge of students, what we call kind of their funds of knowledge, what they know in the local homes and communities, the knowledge that they already bring to the classrooms. That is not measured in the NAEP report. It's not always acknowledged in K to 16 settings. Mm 
and it needs to be mm -hmm. because students don't come to us as blank slates. They come to us as social and cultural, knowledgeable individuals, and we need to find a better way to support them and understanding you know, how they approach reading, how they approach writing. If we understand that, then we can better support them in moving that knowledge forward. So although the report was released recently, uh, as you point out, the substance within it actually dates back to uh, pre-2018 and, and even 2002. Um, so are these issues perhaps reflections of a systemic problem with the U.S. education system? Yes, it is. It is, a, it is very much a systemic problem. It is. The only way that we can break the system of deficit-oriented narratives um, in, towards particular students of color is to really get away from high-stakes standardized testing. That's, that's really the only way. But there's so much accountability built into these systems. And when I mean accountability, I mean um, funding goes to, it determines how, how school systems get funding. It determines how school systems um, hire and retain teachers. Um, it determines how resources are distributed among school systems. These get tied back very much to the, um, to the test results, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, New York State, we could talk about New York State because I'm in New York State, State New York State high stakes testing. During COVID, we had a freeze in, high, in testing, state testing for that spring 2019, sorry, 2020 semester. Mm -hmm. there, were no, there was no testing given. So what happened the following academic year was that it caused a panic because the question then became, how are we going to measure whether students learned anything? Right. Well, there are other ways to measure that. There are formative and summative assessments. But then again, it ties back to who has access to online schooling. And um, so what in the spring 2020, um, when we started, let's, sorry, let's go back to fall 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fall 2020. Um, school systems were just trying to get up and running again. Right. They right. were trying to figure out the online, how they're going to get the kids online, if they were going to do in person. They were so overwhelmed with navigating the pandemic. Um, were they thinking about high stakes testing? Probably not. Right. Because there are a little bit more important issues about health and safety and emotional well-being that teachers and schools needed to get to. So then. Um, Fall 2020 comes, goes, comes and goes, spring 2021 comes in, and we are wondering, okay, what about the high stake testing? Well, then the Biden administration said states have to do the testing because it is tied to so much of federal funding that comes down to states. Mm -hmm. So what do those scores really tell us? They certainly do not tell us about what was truly being learned, right? Because we don't have a benchmark from spring 2020. Mm -hmm. And they don't really tell us about the emotional struggles that families went to through, the struggles in distribution of resources across communities, particularly communities of color. So those are neglected and what those state scores are coming going to come out with. Right. Um, and it is so it's a very systemic because it's so built into the educational system. When COVID came and disrupted it, we were caught in a deer in headlights. Then we didn't know what to do. As students begin to take more in-person classes um, mm -hmm. and, and return to school, what sort of advocacy work from school leaders and teachers would you like to see? I'd like to see, you know, it's a great question. The advocacy work I would really like to see is, one, being sure you tap into and get in, bring in families and communities. Moving out of the pandemic educationally is going to require a community effort. 
it's going to be it's going to require families participation it's going to require us to think about schooling in a more holistic way we will we are not just looking at test scores but we are looking at a child holistically emotionally socially um, of course you know uh, cognitively and linguistically we need to think about the child as not a whole child but also a child that is who is part of a family and a community. It's going to take a community effort. And um, the part of the American Rescue Act that's coming down has a lot of funding for community-based schools and university-based community partnerships. Mm -hmm. I truly believe higher ed needs to move in that direction with teacher preparation if we want to provide the range of resources to schools. But it's also going to take schools some rethinking and reevaluating on their part to, you know, welcome those types of changes because they're certainly not easy changes and they're not going to happen overnight. So that's part of the advocacy that I would like to see is schools and really recognizing that to move out of the pandemic is going to take a community effort, it's going to take a community lift, and it's going to take partnerships. And they, you know, to, to start thinking about how we can do that. The same thing with higher ed. I think as teacher education um, prepares, we also need to think about if we want to create a culturally diverse, equitable workforce for teacher education, we need to think about teacher preparation in a different way. We need to think about how we're gonna get teachers more into the communities in their preparation, how they're going to see communities and families through an asset perspective rather than through a deficit perspective. And thinking about, um, you know, anti-racist, culturally responsive types of frameworks that provide a lens for future teachers to work through pedagogically um, in their classroom. It feels like, at least from what I'm gathering, that the role of education activists is at an all-time high, particularly right now, and, and that the future of education is sort of in this precarious position. Yes. Yes, absolutely. We opened up um, this uh, podcast with talking about learning loss, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because of the pandemic. But what we're not talking about also are the twin pandemics. So yes, COVID was one pandemic, but during COVID, not only did we see the inequities in schooling, but there were also movements across the U.S. socially and um, culturally with with an anti-racist approach. Um, And that was another... um, you know, occurrence during the pandemic, it was more of the social unrest that happened. And um, that really, I think, sparked activists and schools of education to finally say, we can't be quiet on this issue anymore. Racism in schools in, in the U.S. is a systemic problem, and it needs to be addressed. And Um, what as teachers, right, we work in our, what we call in our spheres of influence, which is that that's our classroom. Mm -hmm. And we can make small changes in our pedagogy to address issues of racism and social injustice. Um, What it's going to take is us to figure out how we talk about those, to make ourselves feel comfortable with these issues. So when we are talking to children, Um, or students, or any student in a K-16 to classroom, this includes college classrooms, that we feel comfortable talking about issues. Um, And so, yeah, it's definitely been a a movement. It's been more, you know, um, activists have been more vocal. These issues have been coming more to the surface. I have also noticed in, um, just in mainstream news, there are a lot of attacks on critical race theory, culturally mm-hmm. relevant pedagogy. You know, throwing around terms like that in mainstream classrooms 
without truly understanding what it is. Um, and I, to me, it's just another attack. It's another attack on education, on the knowledge of teachers, on folks who, um, who have been studying this since the 1970s and 1980s. So this is a really exciting time now in education um, to see this shift in this movement. And when I see these, um, you know, these mainstream articles around um, critical race theory as a problem in classrooms, I, I, I'm just shocked at, at, at just the true lack of understanding what critical race theory is. But the fact that there's some recognition that we race is like, you know, important or not important. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that there's by reading, looking at these articles, I'm shocked that people are feeling that race is not important, that that discussion is not important in classrooms when it is very important. So you talk a lot about high stakes standardized testing and its negative repercussions. Um, would you say that opponents against the movement, uh, against standardized testing, suffer from maybe a lack of education? And along with that, could you maybe expand on the role that high stakes standardized testing plays in the U.S. education system? It's not so much people not being educated. I think there are very strong advocates. So let me give you an example. Um, let's talk about a family. Let's just talk about a family. One example of a family whose whose son did not perform well on the New York State ELA test. Right? It's a high stakes test in some way. Um, so the family becomes concerned. Right? Now the family may know that the child is more than a number. Is more than a one, two, three, or four when it comes to testing. But the family becomes concerned because there's a higher authority telling them that your child is not progressing based on grade level. So the family gets panicked. Then the family says, maybe I need to test my child for special education, right? So it's just what, how we react is more along the perpetuating a system. It's the system that starts to take over our thoughts. And while we may know that, you know, the family's son is more than a number, can do a lot of fantastic things, um, may enjoy school very much, suddenly when that family hears, oh, your son performed a two, received a two on the English um, language arts uh, New York State test, and that means not progressing, you know, slightly below progressing, then the family gets concerned and says, oh my gosh, what should I do? So here is where socioeconomic status plays a big role. The family who has the ability may get tutors and may get, you know, support that child in other different ways. Um, the family who doesn't have those resources, then that, that, that narrative just continues to perpetuate and that child may never get out of being a two. So, um, you know, it really has more to do with just getting eaten up by the narrative. And then before we know it, our actions are kind of perpetuating the narrative because it, then it makes sense to us, right? Everybody's talking this way. And if everybody's talking this way, then maybe I should talk this way. So um, the change really needs to come, you know, from from really rethinking education. What is it, what is the purpose of education? And what is the purpose of the, of the test? Now, am I realistic? Are the state tests going away anytime soon? No, they're not. But, um, but the longer they stay, the more they perpetuate a, a narrative of deficit, particularly among um, underrepresented um, students of color and linguistically diverse students. So the recent New York City controller report that I mentioned at the top of the show revealed that during the pandemic, 46% of students with disabilities didn't receive part of or any of the services outlined in their IEP, mm -hmm. otherwise known as individual education plans. 
how do families adjust to this sort of a loss? I mean, are there any methods of teaching that can perhaps be adopted or me- methods of teaching that can be thrown out this year to address the IEP loss? Mm-hmm. So families need to continue to advocate for their children. I mean, that that's really what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, you know, look, looking at the special education system, the IEP system, um, looking at the process, it's overwhelming. It's, it's, it can be very overwhelming to families. I have worked with families um, through a university-based community um, center many years ago before coming to the college and trying to get them, um, you know, to trying to get at their knowledge of um, schooling and school systems, particularly the special education system is it's it's a challenge because it just is so com- complex so families certainly mm-hmm. need to ask questions advocate for their students or their children find out what services they are receiving and how are they going to receive the other services so that's one piece certainly the advocacy piece. Schools need to realize also that families are advocates for their children and schools need to keep an open mind and, um, you know, an open door to trying to work with families if their children have IEP special needs. Um, partic- but we can put in linguistically diverse students too, bilingual, multilingual students who should be re- also receiving different types of services. You know, so that advocacy piece is um, important. The other piece of it that's important is that, of course, families engage their children in a lot of different meaning, meaningful experiences, and they just need to continue to do that. Um, they need to continue to support a positive view of education in, in the families, in their own family, um, and working with their children. You know, if I think about linguistically diverse students, it tends to, uh, that, that has been my research over the years is that even if a family is not fluent in English, that family can work with their children in their other home language. It's still building cognitive Mm -hmm. knowledge. It's still building linguistic knowledge. And it only makes learning English faster and quicker. And that you are, families can be working across a range of resources, language resources that they have in the family and the community. So, so yes, families can be advocates. Families can continue to um, support the children's educational progress by, um, you know, supporting different types of reading practices in the home, writing practices in the home. But we also have to make sure we are not measuring families up constantly against school-based notions of learning because families work differently. Um, They don't test their children per se. And if they do, what research has shown us over the years that upper to middle class families practices in education in the home tend to mirror those practices in school. Lower socioeconomic families, families of color, linguistically diverse families tend to have practices in the home that are that rain that divert from school-based practices so what's happened is that we've we've privileged those school-based practices in the home and by doing that we were privileging a certain type of family while marginalizing another type of family so we don't want to do that either so um it goes back to one of your other questions sammy about you know what what do schools need to do and schools really should go back to that community you know thinking about that community approach and providing different services in the schools not just for children but for families too so they so schools can work Mm -hmm. with families and um addressing any types of loss or um that happened any types of services that were not met because of the pandemic. Um, we, the pandemic, you know, the crisis management, we, we were in triage for a long time. We were just trying to sort out where we were, what we were gonna do. Um, we 
have moved out of that. So now we need to stabilize and we need to stabilize what is going on, where do we need to go? How, how's, what's learning gonna look like? How are we gonna move forward from um, you know, what happened during the pandemic? And the pandemic is still going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I don't think there's any closure anytime soon. Um, so it, it's going to have to be a, these are going to be issues that schools and families and communities are just going to have to constantly um, return to and address. So the conversation surrounding learning losses has been largely focused on young children. And, you know, I think for good reason, I, I think children, for the most part, tend to deal with learning losses uh, more than older students. But does this also affect college students? It, it certainly does. And um, it could be, mm -hmm. there's a different way to, um, to measure, you know, wh how we might think about that. So when we talk about learning loss in the K to 16, we're really measuring that up against, you know, how a student would perform if um, in, kind of expected circumstances, mm -hmm. what the expectation would be if they continued on their path, right? At the, yeah. at the college level, we don't have those types of metrics. So for example, in the K to 16, prior to the pandemic, students may take an assessment, you know, in the beginning of the year, and then at the end of the year, and then we look at growth. And then the next year, they take another assessment, and we look at growth, right? Well, we don't have that type of metric in, in, in college classrooms. So the learning loss looks a little bit different. Um, and that really has to relate to, you know, how, how students navigated, were able to navigate the shift to online and remote. And particularly during the spring 2020 semester, where a lot of us had to pivot within 48 hours. Mm -hmm. So there might have been, you know, sessions and classes where professors, just because of the pivot, could not communicate with their students in a timely manner, could not give feedback in a timely manner. So this, this, there was a lot of independent type learning um, that, that maybe college students had to do um, in terms of their... Um, of their coursework. Mm -hmm. So if you think about as students at, in the college level progress, if you have a prerequisite course that builds on another course, right? And that prerequisite course was disrupted because of the pandemic, that's going to cause you to not have the same full body knowledge in that next course. So it does have a domino effect. And mm -hmm. we were, you know, one of the reasons we have prerequisite of cor re courses is so we don't have to do a lot of reteaching of content, that a student can take a prereq and then move into the next course and then progress that way. <clears throat> the pandemic surely, you know, might have disrupted a lot of those prereq courses. And not to mention that, you know, college students just like K to 12 students may have had a lot of personal loss during the pandemic that caused them to disengage with the um, with their classes and their their course of study. And so students may have had to take a break for a semester or two while they sorted out different types of issues. So now they've come back into the college and they've lost those few semesters. So they've lost the flow, the ebb and flow of, of their programs of study, and they're having to reboot that. And so I am finding that because of the pandemic, that that's, that is happening a lot where students have had to take a break or um, they, you know, they, they've had to basically take a break because of a lot of personal, you know, loss or concerns. Um, or they just didn't have the access to the online and they didn't feel that the that it would be relevant to them. Is there maybe a sense of confusion among students who are now traveling for, say, one or two hybrid classes, then being fully remote for their other few classes? 
I mean, does that confuse the learning process? No, it doesn't confuse the learning process. I think what it does is that it, it so when I think about, you know, some, some school, some universities prior to the pandemic had a, had a notable online presence or had a note, you know, had a good mix of online hybrid and in-person classes. Those colleges and universities are out there, and that, that it was before the pandemic. So there's no research that shows that having a hybrid online mix of classes, it, it has a negative impact on um, student learning. And those studies have been mostly done in higher education because we just don't have that model, right, in, in the K-12 system. So there are really no studies that have shown that having a mix of classes, um, you know, um, disrupts any type of educational experiences. But prior to the pandemic, those studies were focused on programs that were strategic in how they provided a mix of classes. So it was strategic what classes would be in person. It was strategic what classes would be hybrid. It was strategic on what classes would be online, right? So the course content could be supported by the mode. Well, what happened with, the, um, with COVID is that that discussion didn't have time. We, nobody had this, everybody had to move to online. And now everybody's have to slowly shift to the reopening. So now those discussions are coming out. You know, everything went online and there was clearly some courses that had a lot of difficulty moving online because of the course content. Um, students may have felt frustrated because of that. Um, it didn't allow for course class discussions like you would in person. Large lecture classes were difficult, may have been difficult to be online. I mean, there was just so many factors. Um, now what's happening is because we're going back trying to switch to reopening we're trying to be a little bit more strategic on what courses should be offered hybrid what courses should be offered online what courses should be offered in person so because of that there's going to be some you know hills and valleys in trying to figure out this process and um and, you know, in those hills and valleys, you're going to get some things right. <laughs> you're going to get some things where you should think a little bit differently about. But certainly, it is a process that's evolving. And um, it's going to also take, to speak to your question, Sammy, it's going to take the, uh, you know, universities to rethink space. Like, um, you know, are there private spaces where students can get on to an online class if they're on campus for a hybrid or an in-person, right? So they're not having to sit in a hallway and do an online, you know, class in between. So it's going to take some thinking on the university ends, too, um, to think about, okay, if we want to provide these different varied modalities, how are we going to support the students so they feel that they can engage in the um, most effective and efficient manner. And that discussion is emerging and it will be ongoing. Lastly, as far as the long-term effects of learning losses go, what are we in for? I mean, do we have an understanding of what the future holds on that front? We really don't know. I think, um, I think we'll have a better idea as we move along. I think we need to think about more and different and innovative ways to assess learning moving forward. Um, I think we're just going to have to rethink, you know, how we rank and sort students into categories, and if that's really reflective of the students' learning gains, learning loss, or just their access to education during COVID. Um, so there's a lot of questions that will be asked by a lot of researchers in the next upcoming months. And it will be interesting to see how that dialogue plays out. And we leave it there on Learning Losses with Dr. Bobby Cabuto, Professor and Department Chair of the Elementary and Early Childhood Education Department at Queens College. Dr. Cabuto, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me today. 
My name is Sammy Ali. Our theme music is Emphatic Flamingo by Checky Brown, courtesy of the WFMU Free Music Archive. You've been listening to QC Pod, the podcast about all things Queens College. We're on Twitter at QC Pod and on the web at queenspodcastlab.org/qcpod. Our theme music is Lake Monsters by John Flansburg of They Might Be Giants. I'm Jason Tuga. Thanks for listening.